Ooh, can I flip it? Yeah. Wow, like a really low stakes pancake. Hi, Sola here at the New York Times Cooking Studio, and this is part of a beginner's cooking series where I teach you all the basics you need to know to be confident in the kitchen. And in today's episode, we are talking all about fish. I'm gonna show you some really easy, simple ways to like conquer fish. By the end of this episode, you're gonna be an aficionado. Huh? Today, we're gonna show you three really simple fish cooking techniques. We're gonna start with a oven roasted salmon, no splatter, crispy skin, delicious. We're gonna do a really simple curry with a frozen tilapia and then fish tacos. We couldn't do this series without having a taco. What's fresh today? Everything. Everything. <laughs> That's what you wanna hear. So when I actually go buy fish, I don't have a plan of what I'm gonna make until I get to the counter, cause you wanna take a look, see what looks good. And if you're not sure, just ask your fishmonger, get to know them. They'll always let you know what's fresh and what's the best thing for that day. Sustainability is an issue. They kind of give you a guide of what level of sustainability the seafood is at. If you're not sure, a great resource is seafoodwatch.org. So it's great to head on over there, check out what they recommend purchasing and then decide. With farm-raised fish, they could be grown in an enclosed pond or in an enclosed area of the ocean. Wild cuts can mean a lot of different things. It could be lion caught. The less sustainable option is there are these nets that they drag through the ocean. Depending on the kind of fish we're talking about, sometimes farm raised is a better option and sometimes wild caught is a better option. Here we have a bunch of frozen fish. A lot of times the fish that you're buying fresh is frozen and they thought it for you. And the great thing with frozen fish is it's frozen in a method called IQF, which means individually quick frozen. So oftentimes this happens right on the boat. They catch the fish, it's frozen at a very, very low temp, not like the temperature in your freezer. They have special freezers. It freezes really fast so that you produce really small ice crystals and you don't damage the texture of the fish once it's thawed. Individual means that it's frozen in individual portions, making it really easy for you to defrost and cook just as much as you need. So whole fish could be intimidating, but you can always ask your fishmonger to clean it for you. It's a lot easier to tell how fresh it is. You see clear eyes, and bright red gills. The scales are really tightly attached. If you see a fish and the scales are just kind of like hanging on by a thread, that's an old fish. You want to stay away from that. And also cooking a whole fish might be one of the easiest ways to cook a fish because you just shove some herbs in there, throw it in the oven and it's delicious. If you go to your fishmonger, they can prepare your whole fish for you however you want. They could simply just scale and gut it or they can move the head and the fins or they can fillet it. The choice is yours, the level of preparation you'd like on your fish. Salmon, it's a really good starter fish because salmon is actually super, super forgiving. It's very fatty, you can like see it. You can see how oily the fish is just when you look at it. And because of that, you don't have to like nail the cooking. And it's also one of the few fish where it can be a little bit under and it's delicious. It could be a little bit over and it's delicious. There's a really wide range of deliciousness. There's a lot of room to groove with salmon. Here I have a couple of center cut fillets. You can also find salmon in steaks. You can also get like the tail end, which is a little bit more affordable. But what's nice with this is you get this really thick side where you can end up with like a nice perfect medium rare. And then you get this really thin side, which is the belly, which gets like really crispy and cooked all the way through. So you get like a lot of variance and textures in one piece by just cooking it in one way. So salmon already very forgiving fish to cook. We're gonna make it even more forgiving by giving it a quick dry brine. And when you dry brine proteins like chicken or duck, it actually takes quite a while. But with fish, 15 minutes to two hours. So you really have no reason to not. So we're gonna go hard and we're gonna go all over it. Make sure you get the sides you want evenly seasoned fish. I remember when I used to watch Emeril live, he'd always say, you don't want your food to taste one-sided. And I think about it every time I remember to season all sides of something. So like, take a sec. And remember, this salt is not too salty, so this is not as scary as it looks. Wow, we did it. It's dry brined. You can do it too. I'm gonna pop this in the fridge for about 15 minutes, and then we're gonna make our cucumber salad. So here we have some of these mini Persian cucumbers. And we're gonna do like a smash technique. You see this a lot in 
Asian cuisine, and it's great because it breaks up the cucumber, so it absorbs the dressing like immediately. And we're just gonna drop it into our bowl. Growing up, we also had a cucumber salad on the table with every single meal. So when I first started cooking, my responsibility was to make that cucumber salad. I'm very deeply attached to cucumber salad. Once we add our oil and lemon, it can be a little bit difficult to taste the seasoning. So I like to season it with salt. Anytime you're seasoning anything, make sure you toss it well and make sure it's had time to like thoroughly dissolve before you taste and decide because you might get a little bit a piece with like too much salt and then misjudge the seasoning of the whole bowl. A bunch of chopped dill. I love dill, but you can use any kind of soft herb you want. Dried cranberries. I love having something a little sweet with salmon. A good bit of olive oil and lemon juice because this is kind of going to be the sauce for the salmon. And we're going to hit it with some lemon zest as well. Now, it's time to roast our fish. My fish has been in the fridge for about 15 minutes and you can see that a lot of the salt has dissolved. The surface is quite wet. If you take it all the way to like dry and dissolved, you're gonna end up with more of a cured texture. Now I know I talked a lot about not rinsing your chicken. Washing your chicken is the worst thing you can do for cross-contamination. But with salmon, it's, it's not as big of a deal because there isn't as much like salmonella, bacteria, craziness happening but you do still have to worry about cross-contamination. So I'm gonna take this back to the sink and give it a quick rinse. Now at this point, if you don't wanna cook it right away, you can wrap it in paper towels, pop it in a zip top bag and place it on ice and store it for three days. But we are gonna cook it right away, so I'm gonna pat it dry. Patting it dry is just like when you pat dry any protein. Moisture is the enemy of brownness, so take your time, thoroughly pat it dry, and it's gonna make a really big difference when it comes to the browning. Now I'm gonna lightly oil it up, this is also going to help with browning and evenly conducting heat. If you do have pools of oil, sometimes they can just like sit on the tray and burn. And I'm going to lightly season with salt. I know it had a bunch of salt on there, but it still needs a little bit more because we rinsed so much of that off. You want to be pretty delicate with your seasoning. This is going to roast in the oven at 425 degrees. It's going to be about 12 to 15 minutes. If you have a thinner tail piece, it'll be faster. If you have a thicker steak, it'll take longer. But I'll show you what you need to look for to know the doneness. So my fish has cooked for about 12 minutes. And right now, it's like a little bit medium rare in the middle, which is what I want, because I'm going to pop it back in for a quick broil to crisp up the skin. The color has changed, it's become opaque. And I like to feel the sides. Give it a little swish. You can tell down here, it's quite firm. When you go to the thicker side, it's got a little bit of give, a little bit of squish. So I know that's like kind of a medium rare. Another way to check is we're gonna poke it. There shouldn't be any resistance. When you poke raw fish, you can tell. It just, it doesn't wanna slide right in, but you know it's cooked when you can get right in there. Let it sit for a moment and then that's gonna allow the temperature of the fish to transfer to the metal. And you can kind of feel it on your lip and be like, oh, that's just like barely warm. I know it's like kind of in a mid-rare place, which is what I want. Now, if you don't have a cake tester or if this feels a little scary and you wanna be sure, just get a knife, just get in there. It's okay, you know? I get it, I get it. You don't wanna sit down to the table and have raw fish. So just get in there and just take a peek. Yeah, yeah, so it's flaking really easily, but it's still just it, right in the middle, a little bit of fleshiness, so we know it's a nice medium rare. Now, since I'm going for the broil for the crispy skin, I've cranked up the broiler, and I'm gonna drizzle it with a little bit of oil just to help us get that final, final bit of crisp. But you can see that it's already quite crispy. This is gonna happen real fast, so just stay by it. I think like one minute. This is exactly how I like it. Even though we did this in the oven, it's like it's fried. It gets so crispy. The combo of the dry brine and the broil is key. And I especially love that the belly part gets really, really crisp. It's crazy how crispy you can get the skin just, oh, without 
needing to use a pan. This is good fish. <laughs> so now I'm going to show you a really easy coconut curry fish that uses frozen fish. And what's great about it is you don't even have to thaw the fish. We're going to let it braise in the really flavorful curry. I'm going to start by getting my skillet heated, medium high heat, a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And while that gets going, I've got red and green bell peppers. The easiest way to cut them is I just cut around the seeds, cut off cheeks, just like that. And we're going to do the old chop and drop. So then we're just going to cut through this way and it makes it a lot easier. And we were able to get rid of those seeds pretty quickly. So I'm going to thinly slice our peppers. We chop and we drop. We're looking to kind of get these nice and softened. It's just a chop and drop, just like Rachel Ray taught us. It looks like a lot of peppers, but peppers are mostly water, so it is going to cook down. The red pepper is a little bit sweeter. It's going to bring one kind of flavor. Green bell peppers are a little bit grassier. It's going to hit us with another layer of flavor. That's why we're using both here. So we got our peppers. We're going to add our onions. And I'm going to season this with some salt. And it's going to really help wilt all of our veggies down. We're not looking for a lot of color, so I'm going to toss occasionally. And you can see some of the peppers I added earlier are already wilted. And it's okay if it's not like totally even, because once it braises with the coconut milk, it'll all come together. Braises and stews are pretty similar things. It's when you cook them in liquid. It allows the meat to get very tender. When you're braising a short rib, we're talking four hours. We're braising tilapia, 20 minutes. The difference between a braise and a stew is just about size and ratio of liquid. So with stews, we're usually talking about smaller cuts of protein, like one inch cubes or shrimp, something that's already kind of small. And it's usually in more liquid, like the protein will be fully covered in the liquid. This is a braise because we're gonna be doing larger fillets and it's gonna have, it's not gonna be fully submerged in the liquid. All right, so our peppers and onions have gotten nice and soft. So we're gonna be using a Jamaican curry powder. You can't just like add spices to something and then it's done. It needs some either like direct heat from dry heat, like in a toasting step, or here we're gonna get it like with some direct contact with fat in this sweating step, or just like needs to be simmered for a while, otherwise it can be kind of chalky and harsh. So we're gonna let this cook out for about a minute, and then it's gonna simmer for even longer with the coconut milk, and that's gonna really help develop a lot of that spice flavor. I'm gonna add some finely chopped garlic, as well as a little bit of grated ginger. And we're gonna let that cook for about a minute. Garlic and ginger also like, if we were just gonna add the liquid right now without giving it a little direct heat, the flavors just like don't, don't fully develop. We wanna pull out those fat soluble flavors with some direct contact with the pan right now. Now what's really cool is we've got just frozen tilapia fillets that we're gonna plop on top. And it's gonna cook through and thaw at the same time. Tilapia is also a really, really affordable fish, so it's good to get to know it. And now I'm going to pour over my coconut milk. This is going to be our braising liquid. To season up those fillets, and we're going to taste it for final seasoning after. I'm going to cover this and let this cook until the fish easily flakes with a fork. Timing is going to vary depending on the kind of fish you use and how thick it is, but we're going to come and check on this after about 15. Okay, so my fish has been simmering away for about 20 minutes, and you can see that the fish itself released a lot of liquid, which helped make this like extra saucy. And we know that the fish is done because it easily flakes. Tilapia is not like salmon. You definitely want to make sure to cook through, otherwise it kind of has the texture of raw chicken. Not so fun, not so appealing. I'm gonna brighten it up with a little bit of fresh lime juice, some scallions, and cilantro. I'm gonna plate this up with a little bit of steamed rice. Now, if you head over to our rice episode, you can learn how to steam your own rice. You can't have curry without rice, that's just wrong. You need rice to soak up all that sauce. Make it pretty for you, for your beauties. Okay, so you can see the fish flakes away so nicely. So you get a lot of vegetalness from the peppers, a nice bit of sweetness from the coconut milk, 
and then a little bit of spice from the curry. And it's all really nice with the fish because tilapia is like a very mild fish, so it can handle any kind of flavor you throw at it. Fish tacos. As someone from California, I have a deep love. This is gonna be a really, really simple pan fry. The fish is just gonna go into some milk and then flour, and we're gonna fry it up so it's like a little bit crispy. For our dredge, we're gonna keep it real chill, a little bit of flour. This fish taco recipe is by Sam Sifton, and he dredges his fish in Wondra flour, which is kind of cool because it's a pre-gelatinized starch, so it doesn't get clumpy, and it also like gets really crispy fast. If you don't have Wondra, you can use all-purpose. No worries. We're gonna season that up with some chili powder, salt, and pepper. It's really important to season every layer, even your dredge. I feel like when you're whisking something dry, you just wanna mix it and be done with it. But it really does take a minute to like evenly distribute the dry into the dry. You can really tell with something like this because there's chili powder, but when you're whisking up like flour with baking powder, baking soda, it can be very misleading. So just whisk longer than you think. So my skillet is getting a little warm. I'm gonna add my peanut oil. You wanna use a neutral fat here. We wanna go hot and fast so we get a nice crust, but the inside doesn't dry out. So for the fish, we're using some cod. You can use really any lean white fish, but cod is very accessible. And we're gonna cut it into strips against the grain. Fish grain, it's a little different from the grain on chicken or meat, because it, it kind of goes like, comes out of the spine and goes like this. I think the easiest way to think about it is if your spine is here, we're gonna go this way. We want half inch pieces here. So we're gonna have some really nice meaty strips for our tacos. And then I'm gonna do chop and drop right into some milk. This is gonna be the wet for our dredge. It's like we're making, what's that called? Are they called fish strips? No, fish sticks. We're making fish sticks for our taco. The great thing when you're frying fish is that typically when it's brown on the outside, it's cooked on the inside, unless you have like a really big, like, like you're doing fish and chips and you have a really big piece of cod, then the doneness might be a little bit harder to gauge. You wanna get in there with a the cake tester. So our peanut oil is nice and hot, so we're gonna get frying. I'm gonna toss this in the milk and then lift it out of the milk and we're gonna add it to our dry. And it's just gonna be like a really light coating. With the pan fry, you just need enough oil to generously coat the bottom, about like a quarter inch, maybe even less. Anytime you're frying anything, you wanna make sure you don't like plop whatever you're dropping into your pan from far away, because that's when it gets dangerous. That's when the oil splatters back at you. So you're gonna be scared, but you can do it. Just get close. We got sizzleage, and we're gonna plop in our pieces of fish. We're making our little fish sticks. And since we have a cast iron skillet, there's no worry of sticking. I know fish sticking can be like a scary thing, but a well-seasoned cast iron skillet is basically like a non-stick, but better because it conducts heat better. You get better browning, better crispies, better little fish stickies. Look at how close my hand is to the oil. Just don't touch it and you'll be okay. But it's not splattering back at me. You can see we're already getting some nice browning. And the other thing about cooking fish is it kind of tells you when it's time to turn it. So that first piece turned right away, so I knew it was done. Don't mess with it. If it's sticking, it means that there's still moisture on that crust. That's what's causing that adherence. So just let it like let it do its thing. It will release when it wants to release. Oh god. I think I'm a little handier with this guy than with Kong. Yes. Ooh, thank you. Oh my gosh. You're like so you're just like so on the ball watching the disaster unfold. Oh my goodness. How do you know what I need? This video is gonna be interesting because you have a shot of me flipping with every single tool possible. The fish, it tells you when it wants to be free. All right, it's time to make our tacos. So here we have some shredded cabbage, a little bit of salsa, a chipotle lime crema, hot sauce, lime, tortillas, time to party. There's a lot of ways to heat up your tortillas. In this recipe, Sam Sifton likes to heat it up with a little bit of fat in a skillet, which is gonna kind of give us like a little bit of a crispy, pliable situation. 
If you prefer a little char, you can do it directly on the gas flame. If you want something that's more soft, you can wrap the tortillas in a wet paper towel and zap it in the microwave for like 30 seconds. Wow, look at that tortilla go. Okay, so I think it's fun to just put everything out, let everyone build. You decide how much fish you want on there, how much sauce, how much slaw. A little bit of a, a little, <laughs> just letting, you guys are just letting everything burn. <laughs> uh huh. You know that this, this is a fancy taco because it's on a really big plate. <laughs> this is fine dining, baby. You want to make something look fine dining in your home? Get the biggest plate you have. And if you want to take it to like the extra stupid level, flip the plate over and serve it on the back. Fine dining, baby. A little crema. I like a lot of cabbage. I like a lot of crunch. Some cilantro, a little lime, a little hot sauce, and we're ready to taco. Really nice and meaty. We get some nice crispy outside from the batter and it's really nicely seasoned with that chili powder. And then when you put it all together, you got your crema, you got your freshness, you got your crunch. It's perfect. And you don't really have to overthink, oh, is this perfectly cooked? This is a fantastic way to cook fish. Do you have leftover salmon? I'm gonna show you what to do with it. Oftentimes when you dry roast a protein, heating it back up can really make it dry out. So instead, I'm gonna show you how to make a really easy salmon dip. There's no recipe, you just follow your heart. I'm gonna start with a base of cream cheese and sour cream. Now I wanna get the base stuff mixed before I add the salmon so I can have nice, nice big flaky bits of fish in there. So we're gonna do a little sour cream. You could do this with whatever you've got. Greek yogurt, labna, do a little cream cheese with buttermilk. Whoa, I like the cream cheese because it's kind of gonna feel like the things you would put on a bagel and then we're gonna have it with a bagel chip. Huh? You could do this with smoked salmon, or if you have any kind of roasted fish left over, like let's say you roasted a whole fish, branzino or something, a little bit of cod, you can flake it and just throw it into this dip. So the beginning part, it's just about making sure you get all those lumps out before you go further. Because if you don't get the lumps out now, they'll be in there the whole time. Okay, I'm just gonna keep stirring. Perhaps we should switch to a whisk. <laughs> Ooh, you know what would be good on top of this? A little bit of caviar. That feels like a nice texture to me. And now we begin adding the flavors. So dill, dill and salmon love each other. A little bit of lemon zest. I don't wanna have the juice here because I like the tang level already, but if you really wanna go for a little bit more brightness, make your dip on the thicker side and add a little juice. You could totally dice up your leftover cucumber salad, put that in here, it will have like a tzatziki vibe. Crazy, I just thought about that all on my own. We're just gonna have big bites of pepper. So we're gonna get some good texture here because we got texture from our pepper, texture from our capers. And now I'm gonna mix this up and taste before I add salt. More pepper, more salt, more capers, more lemon zest. I'm gonna keep the flakes kind of big right now because as we mix it in, it will further flake. It's also good, whenever you make dip, stick a chip in there because otherwise I feel like people get afraid to just dip and they'll spoon on their plate. That's no fun. Get in there. It's a dip. It tastes like a bagel with all the stuff you want on it, you know, in dip form. And more importantly, you took like a little bit of leftover salmon and stretched it. I hope you saw that there's a lot of fun, easy, foolproof ways that you can eat fish. Go forth, you are now, and just like that, you are an aficionado.